Hello, everyone. This is Kip Kolsinskis. Thanks for joining us here today. And uh, this webinar, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Strategies for Connecticut. Again, I'm Kip Kolsinskis. I'm a conservation and land use specialist for Yukon Extension. And um, this webinar is brought to you through funding provided by a grant from Yukon Extension in a cooperative effort with Yukon Extension and the Risk Management Agency. So you're all muted right now. And though we do have a chat function, which I believe you'll find in the uh, upper right hand corner. So you can certainly ask questions during the presentation. And though because of my limited ability to forward slides and type at the same time, it may not be till the end before um, I'll try to leave some time at the end to be able to answer any questions that you may have. And then there's always um, any that we don't get to answer at that point in time, you know, we'll, I will answer them and send it back to you as a email as well. So let's get started. So some of the goals that I would, I would have for produce for you, you folks and for producers in Connecticut with a changing climate is to try to increase your understanding of what these climate change impacts are in Connecticut and the Northeast and talk about some adaptation mitigation strategies, um, look at some adoption of different kinds of farm financial practices that can enhance resilience to climate change and provide some relevant information so that when you are talking with your customers and policymakers and elected officials, they understand the challenges that you may have as a producer. Increase your knowledge of federal and state programs and crop insurance tools that can help you with your risk management and with some of the changes you may decide to have with your operation and to increase the amount of planning that you're going to do for climate extremes and emergencies. So not just the, the strange variability that you're going to have to deal with, but also those, those catastrophic events. And then I think that's something that we can all do is to share our experiences, you know, what's working and what's not. And, you know, we're all each other's teachers. So I really want to enhance more dialogue and sharing of, uh, you know, what the situation is and what you need to help be successful. And what we all want, of course, is a resilient, adaptive, economically successful agriculture in Connecticut. We want you folks to be successful and to make money. So again, we know that the glaciers are melting, sea levels rising. Fortunately, you know, that's not, we don't have to worry about glaciers as our, our water source like they do in some parts of the world and that we're not like in the Delmarva Peninsula or the coastal areas of North Carolina where they're getting saltwater intrusion that are, that are impacting their fields. But we, but we will have effects. And we know it's going to have effects all over the world. It's really going to change the food system. It's going to change what areas are going to be suitable for certain kinds of crops. It's affecting our ocean environments, which is where right now a huge amount of the protein comes from to feed the world. Uh, we have temperature increases that are going to change, um, you know, the suitability for cropping some parts of the world. And the water cycles are going to be different, less productive, and we're going to have to change how we eat and what areas are producing what kind of crops and uh, work hard to, you know, manage the effects of China, climate change and all the impacts. So that's one of those things I like about this particular slide, I think it captures all of those, those impacts from kind of a global perspective. And since we are in a, a global economy, uh, we need to keep that in mind as well. So, and again, you know, we've had everything here from drought to floods. In the lower left-hand corner there is some hail that from some of you may have experienced last summer in Connecticut. And I don't ever remember seeing hail that size here in Connecticut. So I, I think one of the points I'd like to get across is that there's, because you don't, you don't hear particularly weather people talking about it, is there's this common misconception that climate change is something that's going to happen. Well, it's happening right now, and you're experiencing it. 
each and every day, you know, there's the short-term weather and then the long-term trends of, of climate change. So, for instance, you know, 2016 was the hottest year on record, and 2018 was almost, so it was the fourth hottest year on record. So there's certainly certainly plenty of, of evidence of those changes that are, that are impacting agriculture in Connecticut. And I just wanted to share this. This was from... <clears throat> Uh, USDA that puts out these these maps every week that I captured this one from the last growing season and you can see based on you know looking at the base period of 81 to 2010 that our rainfall from last year that we were over 200 to 300 percent of average precipitation from that base period you know, typically Connecticut averages 48 to 56 inches of precipitation. So most of Connecticut was well over 60 inches last year. So that's, uh, you know, that increased precipitation and more precipitation. You know, USDA has already uh, changed some of the plant hardiness zones in the United States and even here in Connecticut. They've tweaked it a little bit, and I think you're going to continue to see that of uh, the plant hardiness zone maps are, are changing. So what I'd like to do next is so that we can really understand what it is that we're going to have to deal with from a, a long-term perspective and what some of these trends based on what the modelers have, have uh, figured out of what's going to happen here in Connecticut in the Northeast of to look at some of these scenarios of major kind of climatic features. So if you look at this particular slide, you can see that kind of the, um, it shows an, a, uh, an A2, which is kind of a worst case scenario if we don't do what we need to do as relates to mitigation. And the B1 is kind of a better case scenario. So we know as far as the, the trend, and as far as I can tell, the trends that the modelers have figured out on some of these important features, you know, are really right on. that We've experienced all of these trends. So we know that it's, it's going to get even warmer. We know that the very warm days are going to get hotter. Again, you think about last summer that we had, uh, you know, over 30, I think it was actually over in, depending on where you were in the state, you know, 35 to 37 days that were over 90 degrees. And we also had warm nights. So, and in all seasons, and that's the, you know, that long-term perspective of, of warmer in all seasons. Very cold days become fewer, you know. Ex we, yes, we've had a, a few little cold periods, but in general, it's been, it was a fairly mild winter this winter. This is, this is there are going to be, of course, some, some benefits and some opportunities that we're going to experience as relates to climate change. We need to understand what that means and how we can use that to our advantage. So having a longer freeze-free season um, may have some advantages for us. That the days with snow cover have declined, which again, if you're in, the, in a, a business that relies on snow, that's not, that's not great. The other thing, of course, is that we need that snowpack for recharging groundwater, for vernalization of plants, for controlling pests and diseases. Uh, longer growing season, again, that's if you can figure out exactly, you know, when the growing season is going to start and when it's going to end, and though that is something that's a, a trend that can be very helpful, helpful for us as well. We know that there's up to 10% more rain. You know, when um, the, the engineers were redoing all of the runoff curves to use for calculations for uh, pipes and bridges and everything else, and they got all the new data and looked at it. You know, from since the last 20 years, Connecticut is about two inches wetter than it has historically been. So we can expect that it's continue. It's going to continue to get wetter. So that's uh, certainly something to think about. It's wetter than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And most of the increase is going to be in winter. And kind of to clarify that, a lot of it is actually going to be early, late fall, early winter, and then late winter, early spring. So again, you think about the, you know, the snowfall that that ruined Halloween. And so we've had, rather than having much snow in the middle of the winter, we've had more 
precipitation and more snowfall events early and late in the, the winter season. So that's kind of the trend that we can expect. And then also these rainfall trends uh, are going to be more extreme and intensive. So from a, you know, a, a thunderstorm uh, where maybe we would have gotten one inch of precipitation, now we're getting two or three. And you're seeing where there are cells within these weather patterns that are, are more extreme rather than everyone in the state, you know, pretty much getting the same amount of precipitation. So that's causing erosion um, and um, some other situations. And again, warmer air holds more moisture. So that's kind of why that's happening. And our dry period is going to lengthen. So I, I think the model is just saying is we don't expect that we're going to have like we did in, you know, in the in the early 60s there of these really long drought periods, but what we had a two and a half year drought, which was quite intense. We're going to have short, intense, very dry periods. So that's something else that we need to consider in our, our planning for agriculture and, and everything else that, that goes on. So now let's take a little bit of a look at uh, in more detail about some of the impacts of these trends on agriculture. And then we'll talk about adaptation strategies. So again, increased heat stress, you know, people experience all sorts of weird things with their, with their crops. You know, we all know that there are a lot of varieties of, of greens and that when they get those hot temperatures, they immediately bowl, uh, bolt, see sun scald on that pepper in the middle. And of course, uh, livestock does not, most of our breeds, which are Northern European breeds, suffer greatly in, in heat and humidity. And then also increased wet weed pest and disease pressure, very weedy, buggy, mold and mildewy season last year, and the fact that we're going to get insects that are going to be able to winter over here and diseases winter over. And there has been, on the left there is some kudzu, there has been um, kudzu found in Connecticut for the first time. Too much water, a lot of you experienced this this past year. So if you have soils that are kind of on the wet side, they're only going to get wetter. And we can talk a little bit more about that. And of course, we all remember a couple of years ago, we are in June, we had 14 inches of precipitation. And then the short term drought risk, risk again, you know, do you have an adequate water supply if we go into another short term drought? And uh, can you plan for one? Getting a better water supply. Again, an opportunity there, less winter possibility, less winter freeze damage, new varieties, more peaches, red wines, grapes. You know, when we had that short-term drought period, we had those warm days, but kind of cool nights, very low humidity. I think some of the wines, that red wines in particular that were produced during that drought period are some of the best red wines that have been produced in, in Connecticut. And um, so, you know, and take a chance on some additional red wine varietals uh, that might be a, a good risk to, to take. And though, as we all remember the year without any peaches or stone fruit, uh, where we had uh, plants or breaking dormancy and then we had that February freeze of really understanding when, when it, our spring frosts and freezes are going to be and what impact that's going to have on, on certain varieties. And to me, that's going to be the biggest challenge that producers have to face is the unpredictability of all of these factors that we're talking about. You know, our success as a species for the last 10, 11,000 years has been having a certain amount of predictability to weather and climate, to know when your first and last frost is, when the rains are going to come, when to harvest. Um, so I think that's going to be one of the biggest, the biggest challenges that we have. So longer growing season, again, can we take advantage of that, you know, being able to double crop and maybe even triple crop in some parts of the state with the longer growing season. Uh, more melons, peppers, I don't know about bananas there on the right, but uh, I'm certainly all for more, more, more melons and, and peppers. And I know a lot of people had a very good year with uh, uh, peppers, particularly hot peppers last year. I think I had some of the hottest peppers I've had in Connecticut last year which was great for me. And then how does it impact crops? A little more detail, you know, in some of your, your cool season crops, they don't like that. 
it, it impacts, it can impact yield, it can impact uh, nutritional content, and it can also impact flavor. I mean, you know, I buy my sweet corn the same place every year, and I would say with the, the hot weather during the day and the warm nights, I don't think the sweet corn was quite as quite as tasty last year as it as it typically is. Reduced vernalization. Macintosh apples really require some cold winter temperatures to really be productive and you have a good yield and good flavor. So maybe we're not going to be able to do uh, Macintosh apples here any longer in Connecticut. Passover wintering, flea beetles, square wing drus drusophila, um, the lanternfly, those are, and with the globalization, you know, there's new pests that are trying to get here all the time. Again, we talked about the possibility of warmer season crops doing better. Livestock, livestock, and particularly, you know, you think about our, our dairy cattle, which are our, our northern breeds, they really don't do well in hot, humid weather. So it's harder on their bodies, they don't eat as much, they produce less. So that's certainly something to think about as far as, as we manage livestock and animals is their, is their comfort level and also what breeds that we're using. So kind of in summary of these climate change impacts of what to expect, and you can see in this example, they've used New Hampshire as uh, you know, what's gonna happen with a, a lower or higher emissions scenario. And worst case scenario is that um, you know, we could have a weather conditions that are as and a climate that's more similar to the Carolinas than it is to Connecticut. So no need to move south because it's, it's coming here. So more frequent days over 90, short periods of drought, longer growing season, increased heavy precipitation, more overall precipitation, earlier snow melt, warmer winters with less uh, snow on the ground, and to me the most difficult, the less predictable weather of your frost-free your precipitation and your dry periods. So, and though, from a Connecticut uh, from a Connecticut perspective, Northeast perspective, we're in a much better situation than many parts of the country, many parts of the world. So, uh, you know, the long-term opportunities for agriculture are actually quite positive here. We know we're going to have adequate water. Sometimes we're going to have too much water. Sometimes we're not going to have enough. So we have to plan for that. We're going to have longer and warmer growing seasons. There's going to be shifts in productivity elsewhere. So, you know, our ability to capture some niche markets and some um, periods of time where some crops might not be available from some parts of the, of the country. You know, we're right here in the heart of the marketplace. We have 24% of the U.S. population here in the Northeast. Potential for jobs and economic growth surrounding agriculture and then also opportunities to protect ecosystem services, to, to provide services that are gonna benefit um, you know, uh, the ability for other, other species to adapt to climate change, to be able to offer flood protection to downstream communities, to recharge groundwater supplies. So perhaps we can find a way for uh, farmers and landowners to be able to, to tap into some of those ecosystem services here as relates to climate change um, mitigation and, in, and adaptation. So again, as we think a little bit about, and that's really, really what I want you all to do is that every decision that you're making, you should be thinking about climate change and the impacts of climate change with every decision that you're making. So just from last year, what were the impacts from, of last year's weather on your farming or gardening? What worked well? Why do you think it worked well? What were your challenges? Why do you think that is? There's something that you can do differently. And did you keep a record or journal? I'm always impressed when I go out there and people have kept very strict records of, you know, what, what varieties that they're, that they're planting and what were their planting dates, what were their harvesting dates, what were their yields. So I think that, that that's really, really helpful and we probably need to do more of capturing that information and sharing that information with each other and with, uh, with researchers uh, as well and the universities. So as we look, let's get into a little more detail about adaptation strategies and really what that means and what are some things that you might do or that people are, are thinking of doing. So as you looked at, at it, there's the whole, you know, the, 
the resistance of management actions to resist efforts of climate change. So you had a bad year of tomatoes. So resistance would be, well, I'm just going to plant more tomatoes. So I'm not going to get great yields or good quality. I'm just going to plant more. So that would be resistance. Resilience would be, well, I'm thinking about it. And, you know, part of the problem was all the weeds that I had. So I'm going to do a better, I'm going to put them on plastic. I mean, you could do a better job of a weed control and maybe I'll plant a little bit more. So that would be kind of a, 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 a resilience perspective to adaptation. And though I think that that can be helpful and though what I think we're also looking for is for transformation of really adaptive capacity, really transitioning to a new system. So maybe what you're going to say is, hey, I'm not going to do all of my tomatoes out of, outdoors anymore. I'm going to do all of them or I'm going to do part of them in a high tunnel where I have better control of the water, of the nutrients. I can do a better job of, uh, of you know, controlling pests and diseases. So that's, that would be transformation. So I think we're looking for not resistance, but resilience and, and transformation. So hopefully that's some of the things you're thinking about. And that we know that um, easier said than done. There are a lot of constraints to farmer adaptation. So we'll take a quick look at that. Physical and ecological limits. You know, in some cases, um, we don't know what the, the capacity is for some of these plant and animal species to adapt, and it just might, might not be possible. Uh, technological limits, again, as relates to varieties. And, uh, you know, if you're in a place where your only water supply is possibly from bedrock wells and uh, they're very low yielding and you have acreage that you need to irrigate, you know, there's not much you're going to be able to do to do about that situation. Financial barriers, when you're talking about putting in conservation practices, uh, affording high tunnels and irrigation systems and wells, there are financial barriers. Informational barriers, you may have a lack of local weather information. There may not be enough assistance for being able to identify some of the new diseases and, and insects that are coming after the crops. Cognitive barriers of people underestimating the risk of inaction or of trying to understand the scientific information that's out there or what's being pre uh, presented of, of what actions to take. And then social and cultural barriers, and we all know of you know, it might be, be coming from your, your customer base, from, you know, elected officials, from your peer groups in the agriculture community of, of trying to do something, something different and adapting to a different situation. So how are farmers adapting to climate change? So I think there's really kind of, I'm sure you might be able to think of others, and we'll, we'll get into this in just a little bit more detail of assessing your risk, understanding your risk, of diversification and all of what that might mean, um, improvements to soil health, use of conservation practices, and then really thinking about some newly adopted production systems. So let's take a look at that in a little more detail. So as we look at in a little more detail at some of these effects that we're feeling and then look at some adaptation strategies. So air quality, we know there's an increase in CO2 and ozone. Increase in CO2 means that the, the physiology of vines and weeds and many invasive plants, they love that extra CO2 in the atmosphere. And unfortunately, some of the, they're, so they're much harder to control and manage and some of the um, herbicide formulations actually do not work as well with additional carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So, and that ozone can um, negatively impact cucurbits and, and tobacco, um, getting leaf lesions and things like that. So again, having healthy plants, reducing stress on plants, diversifying varieties and the kinds of crops that are grown, better monitoring, IPM, that can help early, early intervention on those weeds. Insect disease, super weeds, again, more CO2, longer growing season, warmer weather, kind of the globalization of, of pests. 
So again, uh, better monitoring IPM strategies in some cases we need. We don't have IPM strategies for some of these things. Um, using cover crops, doing a better job of rotating our crops and crop families, sterilizing equipment, better biosecurity. That's something that we really, they do much more of out west than we do here, is when you're borrowing equipment or moving equipment between fields of making sure that you're washing it and sterilizing it, um, being careful about people coming on the farm, and then have rapid, rapid intervention plan. So when there is a, a threat of some sort that you take care of it as quickly as possible. If you see a new a new pest or disease or or weed that you let somebody know. So a whole new variation of the see something, say something, I suppose. And then adaptation. Again, you know, probably the high tunnel is the poster child for adaptation strategies of, again, as I said before, I know people that have said they'll never grow another tomato outdoors again. They're just going to do them in, in high tunnels because of the ability to better control the environment and reduce the variability. And, uh, you know, again, it allows you to extend the growing season, do alternative crops, reduce some of the, the, uh, the risk. Precipitation, again, something that we really experienced this past year of intense rainfall events. You're getting more erosion, you're getting more leaching, you're delaying your planting and your field work. A lot of people weren't able to get their cover crops planted. They had a lot of, of compaction and rutting in their fields trying to get their crops off. So again, adaptation strategies using cover crop, um, um, no-till or reduced zone tillage, raised beds, increasing organic matter, looking at your water control structures in and around your fields, grass waterways, subsurface drainage, increased heavy wet snows, delaying your planting, ponding and flooding in the spring, some adaptations, uh, different varieties, diver diversifying what you're growing, really understanding your soil resources. And we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. And again, your adaptation from your infrastructure of reinforcing buildings, using some different building design. I know most people have gone to the Gothic style of high tunnels because it's much better at shedding snow, you know, increasing the distance between their, their high tunnels and their ranges to be able to deal with the snow removal. And then also we have the less predictable water. I, I, we're going to have plenty of water. It just may not always be there when you need it. And again, because we rely on a lot of bedrock wells with low yields, so by um, managing your soil health, increasing your organic matter, which holds moisture, using surface mulches to reduce evaporation, and uh, putting in irrigation systems, um, using cisterns and storage reservoirs, reducing plant density, having more local weather information, and um, you know, I. To me, anybody, if you're making investment in, um, in fruit crops or vegetable production, you know, you really need to have some sort of backup water supply. Now, here's an example. This is at uh, Masaro Community Farm. I have a few examples from there with Steve Muno. And again, he has, he has drip tape and he also has some overhead micro irrigation so he can get some frost protection and, um, you know, he's got them across the slope, so it's helping to prevent erosion. He's, he's able to manage his fertilizer use better, use less water. And then, you know, we need to think about if you have, again, soils with a high water table or that your, your fields are downslope of upslope areas of looking how to manage excess surface and groundwater. Um, there are conservation practices and tools for that, diversions, raised beds, land leveling, waterways, subsurface drainage, cross and slope tillage, contour strillage, strip cropping, all those kinds of things. And some of these people may not necessarily be that familiar with. We'll look at a couple of them here. You see on the left, there's some, some uh, contour tillage there, uh, bottom left is some ditches that are, are well maintained and in the middle are some raised beds so it's warming and we'll look at that in a little more detail. Upper right you've got a stone lined 
uh, waterway as an outlet structure from some diversions and grass waterways, and then there's an outlet from um, tile drain, subsurface drain, although it does not have an animal guard on the end, which it should have to keep muskrats and critters from crawling up in there and dying. So again, a uh, little more detail. This is again is a Masaro community form. Steve has a bed maker, so it raises the beds, so it can prevent waterlogged plants, and it can also capture moisture. They're, they're across slope. It warms the soil faster. And the year where we had the 14 inches of rain in June, he had these raised beds covered in plastic mulch, so there was actually less water falling around the plants and it was their roots were just a little bit elevated because of the bed maker and he had much less water logging and, and dead plants and disease problems where he had these uh, raised bread beds for his vegetables. Rainwater harvesting and catchment and storage, I think there's a lot of opportunities there. If I was building a new or renovating an agricultural structure, um, I would be putting some sort of a cistern or a catchment system with my gutters. Um, you may not need it every year like last year, although you know, we did have a couple of, of dry periods so that if you were seeding something, you know, had just put in a new seeding of something, you might have needed water. So I think that would be a good investment and the cisterns are, are relatively inexpensive. Stream precipitation, infrastructure adaptation. So this person has a covered heavy use area and is using wood chips in the heavy use area to try to you know, keep the animals um, clean and dry and also um, helps with uh, reducing runoff and erosion. I probably would put a cistern there to try to capture some of that roof water as well. And here's an example where somebody's retrofitted their high tunnel with a gutter and a cistern system. And there's actually some kits you can buy now that actually uh, allow you to capture and, and reuse water. I think that's a good investment. Keep your soil covered as much as possible. We've really seen some increased erosion on some of our soils from in the past because of the intense rainfall events. So keep your soil covered as much as possible. Protect so your soil aggregates. Our soils, because fine sandy loam is our dominant texture, they don't have really strong soil aggregates or the little you know, chunks of soil. They break down under those intense rainfall events. It suppresses weeds, conserves moisture, cools the soil. Hot soil um, is really hard on the, the, uh, the soil web and all the food web and all the critters that live there and can actually end up with, uh, when you have temperatures that get 90 to 100, it really severely impacts the plant. So this is something that I hadn't seen before. This was a new orchard on a slope. Because of all these extensive freeze-thaw cycles we've had through this winter, and they had you know, bare cultivation along these, these um, new, new plantings of fruit trees, and so there was partial frozen ground because of the bare soil. It warmed up, it's dark, and so that soil, the first couple of inches of soil thawed, but the ground was still frozen on the grass strips in between, and we had rain over this partially thawed ground and ended up getting runoff and erosion. And so recommendation is that it needs to get some vegetation there or uh, you know, try to use some, maybe some uh, wood chip mulch. Of course, there's a concern of, of rodents there, but uh, also of possibility of some subsurface drainage as well because in some cases because of the high water table you were getting groundwater that was discharging and causing some of this as well. So temperature patterns, so it's not only impacting your planting and harvesting and but also those of you that rely on you know pick your own operations and having the public out there and also just uh, worker and farmer health is looking at um, diversifying your crops. In some cases, you can change your planting dates. In some cases, you can't. You know, as we know, for some of those greens, it gets too late, and they're just immediately they're going to bolt. Um, so, and again, with storage, we know there were people that had their their pumpkins and squash 
ripen early and they didn't have adequate storage to be able to put them in and store them to when people wanted to buy them. Um, not having a firm date on your CSA starting, probably a good idea. Um, higher air soil count, keep that soil covered, keeps it cool. You know, I, I go to Belltown every year to pick my blueberries and I noticed the last couple of years that they've had pop-up tents for shade and they've had big buckets of water bottles for people. And I said, well, that's a really good adaptation strategy because if people aren't going to come out and pick, you know, you're, you're in trouble if you have pick your own blueberries. So I thought that was a good adaptation strategy. And for those within the livestock, you know, we're talking about putting, uh, doing uh, silver pasture and of actually designing to have trees and, and shade back in our pastures. And uh, I like, I thought this is a cute picture here with these belted galloways in this shade structure. You could throw in a bale of hay and they would be very happy. They could have a party there. And I've also seen uh, people using some shade cloths, which are relatively inexpensive in with their pasture raised chickens of having a, a shaded area for the chickens to, to get out of the sun in. So of course we know there's some great fabrics out there. Um, there's certainly a cost and management associated with them and time. And though they're fabulous for trying to regulate um, temperature and reduce weeds and be able to manage moisture and humidity. So I think we need to continue to look at those as really important tools and adaptation strategies. And again, my background is a soil scientist, so I'm always thinking about the soil and again, protecting our best soils, those well-drained soils that are nearly level. Those are gonna be the most resilient and resistant to the impacts of climate change and have the fewest environmental impacts from farming them. We need to protect our groundwater recharge areas, our wetlands and water courses to get that in the ground. Uh, people really need to understand the basic properties of the soils on their on their farms, in their communities, try to capture extra water when we have it, and really utilize, understand, utilize the, the uh, diversity of soils that you may have on your farm or your property. And think about if you, all you have is wet ground, about you know, renting or purchasing some different soil resources. So again, just to emphasize this a little bit of how soils impact agriculture, the suitability of different crops, your plantability and farmability, the moisture holding capacity, rooting depth, the fertility, the soil temperature, all these things are, are that are important to you are impacted by the soil. So the hydrologic cycle, which again, we're talking a lot about soil water management. Soils are an integral part of the infiltration of getting water into the soil, percolation, which is water flowing down through the soil profile, being able to recharge the, the bedrock and the sand and gravel aquifers, um, being able to you know, have water get out onto our floodplains and for wetlands to be able to store water and release it slowly. So again, it's all about the soil. And we have one of the most complex soil landscapes in the country because of our geology, because of the glacier, as the average field size in Connecticut is five to seven acres. And you know, you can have three or four different soil types to be able to manage in a, in a field. Part of it is understanding the landscape position. Of course, drier soils are off front of the summit of the shoulder. Wetter soils are going to be at the toe of the slope. You might be able to manage water to get some of that water away from um, the back slope and foot slope positions to dry them up a little bit. Understand your drainage class. On the left there is depth of inches from the surface. And well-drained soils means that the water table is, you know, really not impacting the root zone. It's typically below 30, 36 inches during most of the growing season. And then um, I've seen our moderately well-drained soils, those water tables are staying up there longer and higher, 18 to 24 inches from the surface. And then if you have dominantly somewhat poorly drained to very poorly drained soils, that you're trying to farm, they're only going to get wetter. Yes, they can be productive in a dry year, but um, in a wet year, you're, you're in trouble. So again, if you think about, here's a Manchester soil formed in sand and gravel. 
In a dry year, you're going to need an irrigation source for in a short-term drought. And in a, in a wet year, they're going to be fabulous soils. And then probably the dominant soil in the state is glacial till. And those glacial tills that have dense till at about two and a half to three feet, which is packed and low permeability and perches a water table, those in a wet year are very difficult to, to manage. So you need to think about subsurface drainage of uh, diversions to be able to move water away from parts of the, of, of the uh, field. How to find out about your soils. The Web Soil Survey is a fabulous tool. We have soil maps. You can uh, identify your fields, identify, it shows you, a, create a map that shows the different soils, gives you information about it. Areas of ridgeberry soils are poorly drained with a seasonal high water table less than six inches from the surface. So it gives you quite a bit of information. I think probably the easiest way to understand your soil's uh, potential and challenges are to use the land capability classes, one being the best, eight being the worst. So that's a, an easy to use tool for understanding your soil resources. And it's free, you can get it online. Uh, NRCS and, and uh, conservation district offices can help you get access to that soils information. But nothing is as good as an on-site investigation with somebody that understands soils. So diversification, we're talking about markets, crops, animals, products, household income, and land use. When we talk about diversification, with improving soil health, um, look at your nutrient management, your irrigation, your organic matter, your erosion control. You can see in this slide that on the left is runoff, on the bottom is the different months. And as you might expect, having a rye cover crop uh, versus no cover, you get a lot more runoff when you don't have a cover crop. And in this one, where you have reduced tillage or conventional tillage and uh, reduced tillage or no-till, that you have a lot less soil loss, which is, again is, is holding nutrients, holding organic matter um, when, you, when you have residue on the surface and you're, and you're not tilling. And then again, organic matter is really important, managing organic matter. I like this for every one inch increase in organic matter, it holds another inch of water. And it also, if you have organic matter level up, it acts like a cushion and you get less compaction in a wet year. Using green manure and cover crops, you're helping with mitigation, you're storing carbon, taking it out of the atmosphere, and it helps with um, preventing erosion, controlling weeds, diseases. Weird things happen with high temperatures and extreme rainfall events and droughts to your nutrients and nutrient management. Again, recommend you pay more attention to nutrient management. You know, think about uh, split applications of fertilizers, the kind of fertilizers that you're using, how you're managing your manure. You actually have a new extension person with Yukon Extension, uh, Catherine uh, Vanderwald, who is, um, certainly willing and able to help people with their nutrient management and nutrient management planning. So you may want to take advantage of uh, have her come out and, and give you a hand. Right. So a lot of, a lot of uh, leaching of nutrients, particularly nitrogen this past year. Again, new production systems. We talked about high tunnels, uh, looking at your varieties and your breeds low pre-harvest investment crops. I thought was an interesting strategy of some things that, you know, particularly for vegetable producers, obviously you're making your money on your tomatoes and uh, peppers and eggplant, but, um, you know, doing an early thinking and maybe there'll be a, a, an earlier growing season of taking a chance and growing some greens or some radishes, um, Seeds, some of those seeds are pretty cheap to be able to, to, in case that there's trouble later with some of your crops. And new initiatives. I think there's some great information that's out there, particularly with the Cornell Institute and uh, uh, the Climate Smart Center that they have there, the USDA Climate Hubs. Change Hubs have some really good information and adaptation strategies. 
So the Climate Smart Farming, there's a bunch of decision tools that you can get access to, and it's not just for New York, it's for all of New England. I use this with, um, they have a tool for, you can put in different kinds of, of plants to use for cover crops, and when you might plant them, and um, whether or not they're, they're uh, how, what your success rate is gonna be. It's called the Cover Crop Planting Scheduler. You can access Connecticut weather station information. I think we probably need to have more weather station information because of our variability uh, and complexity of climate here. So this is some stuff they pulled up from South Glastonbury. Air temperature, soil temperature, wind speed, average soil tension. So there's some really good information that you need to tap into there. And then think about what happened this past year, you know, and what happened in, in 2016 of the crop loss crop losses and impacts on agriculture. Um, again, I know that there was a lot of erosion, compaction, people had trouble getting their crops off, getting their cover crops planted this past year, uh, parts of fields flooding out, never, and never being able to get it planted. So assess your risk. You know, we've talked a little bit about that. Understand your soils, um, your infrastructure, look at your management, look at your crop insurance that you have, and what will you change or try this year? What do you need? So I was talking with a hay farmer, and I said, you know, so after last year, what, it, what, what do you think you might do differently? He said, well, I know that they have a very small window in which to harvest hay, and I was thinking about getting some new equipment, so I'm actually going to get some larger equipment so I can harvest, um, when I do have that window, harvest the stuff faster. So I thought that would seem like a, a, good, a good strategy for him. Emergency preparedness, that's for the big storms, big, big events. Farm Bureau has some, Connecticut Farm Bureau has some awesome information up there. So if you go to their website, look under the resources. Um, there's a good guide at Penn State for help you with disaster preparedness to be able to have a uh, post some emergency contact information work with your local responders so they know about your operation, know who has resources that can be used or shared. I think that's a good strategy. And then, you know, your farm level adjustments for adaptation and transformation. So, of uh, you know, looking at what varieties you're growing. I know talking with, after the drought, Terry Jones, who grows a lot of squash and pumpkins, I said, Terry, how do they do? He said, well, I have this one field that I can't irrigate I had traditional varieties of, of pumpkins in there, and then I had new varieties, and the new varieties tend to be more of a bush uh, growth pattern, and the older varieties with the long vines, he said they did much better in the drought conditions because the long vines, every place they touch the ground, they develop a new root system. So when we got these little showers, they were able to capture that moisture. So I really didn't see much yield reduction in the old varieties of pumpkins but in the new ones that are the bush varieties, I had lower yields. So he said, you know, I'm never in that field, I'm never gonna just plant the newer varieties again. So I thought that was a good, a good uh, adjustment that he was making there. And then I think that there's a lot, of, a lot that we need to do as relates to government agencies, NGOs and universities, of new decision tools. Um, you know, we need to figure out how to manage some of these pests and diseases have better crop insurance, provide financial assistance for adaptation, and really pay attention to our land use and climate change policies. And that also of, of having secure land tenure, particularly for beginning farmers. We, we have a, a significant part of our, our farmers that rent or lease a portion or all of their land. So to be able to make these investments, you need to have more secure land tenure. Some good resources out there. Again, I recommend uh, visiting the Northeast Climate Hub the Northeast Regional Climate Center at Cornell. There's some uh, grants through Connecticut Department of Agriculture. The transition grant can help you with some of the stuff. The restoration program does wells, irrigation systems. NRCS has the EQIP program. There's disaster insurance from Farm Service Agency. Energy programs, which can help with the mitigation with rural development. Yukon Extension has specialists. As I mentioned, Catherine can, ha can help you prepare a nutrient management plan. Connecticut Experiment Station, crop insurance providers, and again, we want you to reduce your, your risk, farming organizations like Connecticut Farm Bureau, CT NOFA, 
um, RCD, to energy, and of course your peers to share information. So again, you know, regardless of how you might feel about climate change and its human influence, wouldn't it just be terrible if we created a better world for, for nothing? So any questions, feel free to give me a call or email me. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions, if anybody has any. So thanks you for your attention and thank you to uh, Mary Conkling and Joe Benelli and Mackenzie uh, White for helping us with put together this risk management and Yukon Extension webinar, which will be posted, uh, the recording will be posted afterwards in the PowerPoint presentation. So thanks for your attention and for joining me today.